Hello everybody, um, good afternoon and welcome back to the LI webinar series. Uh, today's webinar is on the effects of light and lighting on landscape uh, by Carl Jones. Um, Carl is with us today, he'll be uh, taking you through his presentation and uh, speaking over the top. Uh, please feel free as always to type questions throughout uh, and after Carl has finished his presentation, there'll be uh, 20 to 30 minutes of Q&A time afterwards. Um, I'm just literally going to open up the question box now because normally at this point, if there's any audio problems, everyone will tell me because they'll be able to see me and not hear me. But it doesn't look like we have any, which is marvellous. Okie dokie. Right, just doing all the audio checks. We don't want anybody to not be able to see us or hear us. Okay, fantastic. So welcome to today's webinar. And now I'm going to hand you over to Carl. Hello, Carl. Hi, Lauren. Thank you for that. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Carl Jones. I've been invited to give a webinar for half an hour uh, today on landscape views, light and lighting. Um, it is probably going to be slightly longer than half an hour, so I am going to rattle through this uh, a little bit. So, and it's my first webinar, so uh, I'm praying that the technicalities don't get the better of me. So please bear with me. So a little about me, I'm Carl Jones, as I said, I'm a chartered landscape architect and a chartered environmentalist. I've undertaken many landscape and visual impact assessments for a variety of developments uh, for many years and acted as expert witness on a number also. I'm currently a member of the Technical Committee of the Landscape Institute, um, but I'm not a landscape, uh, sorry, I'm not a lighting designer and uh, not a lighting professional. So I work for a small multidisciplinary environmental consultancy. We're in the West Midlands, uh, covering the whole of the UK. Been established over 20 years and have been providing landscape uh, architecture services for about seven or eight years. So in the presentation, I'm aiming to provide uh, a better understanding of the potential adverse effects of lighting on views and the landscape uh, when undertaking LVIAs, landscape character assessments, etc., and to encourage greater appreciation of the nightscape. So I'm aware that there will be a, a number of people there with different levels of knowledge in this area. So what I'm going to do is set the context, first of all, in terms of landscape, visual amenity and views. Talk about why landscape and nightscapes matter. Talk about the various effects of lighting on views and landscape, when assessments may be relevant. Talk a little bit about the guidance and on interdisciplinary working, and then relate that to the LVIA process. So talking about the context, uh, we're probably mostly aware of the European Landscape Convention, which commits the Council of Europe countries to promote landscape protection, management and planning and applies equally to outstanding as well as everyday or degraded landscapes and became binding on the UK in March 2007 and is led uh, in terms of implementation in England by Natural England. And in the ELC, landscape is described as an area as perceived by people whose character is the result of the action and interaction of natural and or human factors. It's described by vis visible elements, such as vegetation and buildings, and partially influenced by non-visible elements, such as geology, climate, uh, pollution, noise, a variety of things, but overall creates an experiential association with a place affecting its perception. And together, these interactions distinguish a landscape from the physical aspects of land and landfall. And of course, it's not just countryside, it does relate equally to cities, seascapes, suburbia, a whole variety of areas. And it's worth remembering, of course, that people can interpret the value and associate with landscapes in different ways and to different degrees. But there are general areas of consensus of positive and negative contributors to our landscape on a variety of scales. But importantly, landscapes are a person's and wildlife's habitats and our experience of landscape contributes to our well-being and affects us on a daily basis, contributing to our quality of life. But landscape character at night and the sky's contribution to a natural environment are often overlooked. Now, multifunctional landscapes provide 
healthy places and access to nature, which makes people feel comfortable and at ease, reducing fatigue and stress, and are restorative, uplifting and healing for both physical and mental health conditions. And of course, lighting can have direct effects and also indirect effects on health, such as light spill leading to wasted energy, which might lead to increased energy consumption, increased emissions and potentially air pollution and knock-on health effects. And the integration of health impact, assess, health impact assessment can be used to assess and minimise negative health effects and maximise positive health outcomes, which we should see more and more of uh, when this becomes uh, an official part of EIA in 2017. And when we describe landscapes, we talk about landscape character and the landscape character wheel it succinctly um, sort of summarises a lot of the aspects and elements which combine to form how we may describe an area. And that can apply, that description can apply to a variety of scales in different ways, right from regional to localised um, scales. So the landscape is an environmental resource in its own right and can be an in indicator of environmental quality. It is an individual aspect for consideration of effects for changes to landscape elements present, for example, number of trees, and the key characteristics defining, defining the area's landscape character at a geographical scale. And of course, lighting itself can be a key positive characteristic of a place. So it's essentially how a landscape and the experience of being there would be described and distinguishes one place from another, giving it identity. And changes to key characteristics may result in the landscape being described differently and may be a significant effect. And the experience of a landscape location is influenced by the surrounding context at remote locations, and that can include the sky during the day and night. But a general characteristic of countryside is dark skies and an absence of lighting. So generally we have a choice over how our landscapes evolve and what we consider to be worthy and representative of us and our landscapes in the UK by good design, policy and decision making. So moving on, the interrelationship between people and landscape also introduces related visual effects and that relates to the views that people have and the visual immunity afforded i.e. the pleasantness of the view, and that is an effect on the human population. The significance of a visual effect is function of the viewer sensitivity, the degree of change or magnitude, and the nature of that change. So visual and landscape impacts are therefore distinct considerations. Now in relation to obtrusive light, this is generally looked at by lighting professionals during the, light, during the design stage, and then after implementation, where there are problems uh, looked at by environmental health officers. And there are a number of aspects which are um, described uh, and looked at separately. So light nuisance is the artificial light emitted from premises so as to be prejudicial to health or to be a nuisance, as described in the Clean Neighbourhoods and Environment Act 2005. So there is a statutory protection element to this. And then light pollution, this artificial light which shines outside the area it is intended to illuminate, called the task area, creating spill light, potentially causing sky glow and glare. And light glare is the visible source of the light itself, which may cause discomfort or even impairment or dazzle through excessive brightness. Our eyes' sensitivity to light is affected by contextual contrast, so objects of the same brightness will appear more obvious, brighter and more intense against a dark background. So it's more likely to be visual landscape and nuisance effects in rural locations than urban locations, and people's tolerances are likely to vary accordingly. Now this takes the assessment of the environmental effects of lighting into the realm of landscape and visual impact assessment. So what does policy say? In England, the NPPF uh, states that the planning system should contribute to and enhance the natural and local environment by protecting and enhancing valued landscapes. And goes on to say that decisions should limit the impact of light pollution from artificial light on local amenity, intrinsically dark landscapes, and nature conservation. But of course, we know the ELC applies equally to outstanding and everyday or degraded landscapes. 
goes on to state that great weight should be given to conserving landscape and scenic beauty in national parks, the broads and areas of outstanding natural beauty, which have the highest status protection in relation to landscape and scenic beauty. There are also lands local landscape designations, for example, special landscape areas designated at local level, and they should be informed by local, uh, landscape character assessments. But all landscapes are valued, and the natural environment, including tranquility, is an important component of a healthy place. So in relation to light, DEFRA has promoted the conservation of dark skies through dark sky park and reserve designation and appropriate proportionate policies. And the Institute of Lighting Professionals recommends that local planning authorities specify environmental zones for exterior lighting control in different areas. And that ranges from E0 for protected dark sky areas right through to E4, urban high district brightness areas. But in 2014, the Campaign for Protection of Rural England produced a report called Shedding Lights, where it surveyed local planning authorities across the UK and found that 35% had no policy on lighting at all. So is it enough? All landscape matters, and dark sky parks need not be confined to remote areas as the principles can enhance virtually all nightscapes. Environmental zones provide good general guidance for light spill and sky glow at that location, but don't allow for visual or landscape effects on character remote from the environmental zone of visible light sources or the shed light. And don't effect, allow for effects of internal light sources on external environments, and don't provide for positive lighting hierarchy and focused aesthetic light detailing for example, for architectural or heritage features. They don't allow for lights from vehicles, and they're not effective for controlling certain developments and domestic installations. So when might these assessments be useful? Of course, when the evidence base for planning authority development plans is produced, for example, landscape character assessments and strategies to inform strategic environmental assessments, design codes, village design, design statements, community landscape character assessments, and view management frameworks. Also to support site allocation submissions made to planning authorities, to support planning applications, EIA and non-EIA, wherever the potential effects are unclear and a material consideration. And designers need tools also to assess and hone their designs. Now in a 2010 uh, survey, again carried out by CPRE, who surveyed the, the population in general across the UK, they found that 83% of respondents said that they considered their night sky to be blighted, with 4% of respondents seeing more than 30 stars in the Orion constellation indicative of dark skies, and a whopping 59% seeing less than 10 stars in Orion indicative of light pollution. Now, there's something called the Bortle scale, which is a nine-level numeric scale that helps to quantify in a consistent way sky darkness at a given location. It needs a little bit of knowledge of which stars are where, but isn't, isn't really overly technical, but allows some quantification of gradual change. So whether it's changing over time, it's getting worse or getting better, and allows some quantification either way. It's not an all or nothing light pollution or dark sky situation. So how does LVIA light and lighting relate? So in views, lighting can detract or distract from key visual and townscape foci through poor lighting hierarchy. So in this view, for example, one might expect the dome at St. Paul's Cathedral to be the most prominently lit um, aspect in the view, but in fact is overshadowed somewhat by some of the brighter lights uh, including Black Friday Station. Interior lights often overlooked uh, with modern houses and structures containing more glass. The exterior effects of internal lighting um, can be significant. And of course, during the daytime, views of lighting infrastructure can also be overlooked, uh, not really being considered to potentially create a, a significant effect, but in fact, can be an important contribution to, to the landscape through street clutter. And there are increasingly sort of uh, 
you know, numerous sort of changes and improvements to the, the technical um, sort of ability of lighting designers to come up with innovative solutions. It's a, a fast-moving environment. So you may not know how to achieve certain situations with lighting yourselves, but do challenge the lighting designers to come up with the solutions for you. For example, on, on here you can see LED lighting integrated into the overhead cables and into handrails to reduce street clutter. There are other aspects which may need to be considered as well, such as reflected light, glint and glare, plus effects on visual immunity, and of course reflection from materials um, which may create sky glow also, such as from water or even uh, grass and other surfaces. Interrupted light or movement of light also does attract attention and distraction in views and can be an important aspect to consider also. So why assess and why protect? We need to inform land use planning decisions and protect the environment and humans from adverse effects, for example in EIA, that's a given. But LVIA goes hand in hand with good design and placemaking and good lighting has a positive role to play in defining a place, providing fresh perspectives as has been demonstrated recently at the Night of Heritage Light events, providing multifunctional spaces for the 24-hour economy. But good lighting design that meets everyone's requirements is not easy. It requires good understanding of the issues and solutions from all involved, including at the local planning authorities, and an understanding of how to assess and communicate effects. Now, two or three years ago, I was lucky enough to have a holiday in the USA, driving around, and after a long journey, found myself at our next destination, which was Death Valley at Furnace Creek. And I was tired, so took a siesta whilst the sun was still shining, and then woke up a couple of hours later to a the darkest sky I had ever seen, but with the most amazing starlit sky that I'd ever seen also, and it took my breath away. And Stock in 2001 likened people's responses to a starry night to that gained from natural scenery or other natural phenomenon. It is a natural and cultural asset worthy of preservation where it is and restoration where it is not, like other forms of pollution. And in an article in Nature 2009, stated, without a direct view of the stars, mankind is cut off from most of the universe, provided deprived of any direct sense of its huge scale and our tiny planets within it. And they are not just the preserve of foreign locations as this view from uh, Norfolk shows. So why assess and why protect? People who haven't experienced something good do not miss it, but its absence removes a key component of our natural environments and part of a healthy, enjoyable, uplifting landscape that forms our habitat. And Whilst there are many factors that contribute to quality of life, the contribution of lighting effects should not be overlooked. Good multifunctional design with multi-aspect environmental consideration is worth the effort as it results in sustainable solutions. So let's aspire to achieving more. So available guidance, obviously most of you will be aware there's the current guidelines for landscape and visual impact assessment third edition an approach to landscape character assessment from 2014, and photography and photomontage in landscape and visual impact assessment, which is currently being updated. But there's other guidance, the Institute of Lighting Professionals, guidance on undertaking environmental lighting impact assessments, or PLG04, is uh, a prominent one. So the GLVIA third edition is written for landscape professionals and does mention lighting stating that visual effects of lighting may be an issue and it may be important to carry out nighttime darkness surveys of the existing conditions in order to assess the potential effects of lighting. Quantitative assessments of illumination levels and incorporation into models relevant to visual effects assessment will require input from lighting engineers. It goes on to say we'll also need to include qualitative assessments of the effects of the predicted light levels on nighttime visibility and the visibility survey and definition of ZTVs or zones of theoretical visibility may need to be reviewed. 
The Institute of Lighting Professionals PLG04 guidance is written for lighting professionals, but acknowledges significant overlap with LVIA. It provides an outline of the LVIA process. It is based on old, superseded Landscape Institute guidance. So landscape professionals should follow the GLVIA3 document. It gives more exacting requirements for LVIAs, but does require input on quantitative aspects and design solutions from lighting professionals. And lighting professionals should follow the PLG04 document. But it's clear there's lots of scope to streamline and combine the assessment process between the disciplines to produce more inclusive assessments and better overall designs. So there is guidance available for light nuisance, lighting design and lighting standards. And the lighting in the countryside towards good practice document from 2006 is still available online, but not now an official reference document for planners. So there are specialist areas of research guidance needed on the effects of light and lighting in relation to LVIA, ecological impact assessment, health and well-being impacts, cultural heritage, shadow flicker and reflected light, health and safety, and interdisciplinary working and shared responsibilities. So the Landscape Institute undertook a survey this year to a range of professionals and found that the majority of respondents felt that environmental lighting effects were inadequately considered in relation to national and local policy, development control decisions, environmental assessments, and health and well-being. It also reflected a strong desire for additional guidance on the environmental effects of lighting. So in the interim, we're producing a new technical guidance note for landscape professionals to bridge that gap between GLVIA3 and PLG04, which is in progress now, and then later, hopefully, more in-depth guidance on interdisciplinary guidance on the assessment of the environmental effects of light and lighting. So in relation to the LVIA process, there's an outline of the, the general process which is followed, obviously looking at desk and field studies, looking at the opportunities, constraints and alternatives, and coming up with an outline design as the start point. And then in the reporting and assessment stage, stating the methodology and terminology describing the baseline situation, stating the assumptions, describing the impact sources, assessing the landscape effects, assessing the visual effects, and of course liaising with the project team, producing iterative designs and mitigation solutions, and then looking at the residual effects, providing a conclusion, relating that back to policy. So the correct use of terminology is important in this process, especially with increasing interdisciplinary working as it is easy even for professionals to get confused. There's a number listed there. Now in relation to landscape value, it's the desirability of landscape characteristics and the acceptability of their loss to different stakeholders. I valued for different reasons by different people and on different scales, for example, local or national. In combination with landscape susceptibility, i.e. how susceptible the landscape characteristics are to specific changes, contributes to our understanding of landscape sensitivity. Now, this has many contributing elements, including scenic beauty, tranquility, cultural associations. And a sky full of stars has inspired poets, songwriters, and artists of generations. It is a cultural aspect of a locality. And dark skies provide important contributions to tranquility. Now, tranquility is often described as the subjective experience from being at a location that provides individuals with the space and conditions to relax, achieve mental balance, and a sense of distance from stress. And tranquil areas are often associated with quiet, remote, or appearing remote, natural, non-developed, and non-busy areas. And the CPRE has uh, online mapping available to help judge um, the relative tranquility across England. It's an increasingly valuable and elusive resource that promotes men mental well-being. It's highly valued and a desirable characteristic. And in 2008, a CPRE survey established that the most valued quality of countryside is tranquility. So when undertaking the baseline before going on site, make sure you're sufficiently informed on identifying the main types of lighting for recording accurately and how they will appear in photographs. Understand the likely lighting requirements, if it's a new development, such as the type, the height, and locations. Understand other likely sources of lighting for cumulative effect assessment, 
for example, approved schemes not yet built. Look at potential existing nighttime landscape features, for example, prominent lit important architecture to make sure that the hierarchy is not disturbed. Understand the likely sensitive night landscapes, for example, designations, existing light pollution and remote policies. And of course, make yourself aware of the sunset time and preferably do the site work when you know there's going to be clear weather to help assess what the existing light pollution is and the amount of stars that you can see. So you may need some additional equipment for the field work. The uh, camera lens hood to try and avoid glare from, from street lights on the lens. A head torch, because you're going to be working at night. It's useful to have a, a tablet or iPad to help you view the photographs on location to make sure they are representative of what you are seeing yourself. You need markers that are visible at night to help you relocate your viewpoints. A laser range finder will be useful to uh, measure the heights of the existing lighting there. And of course, it may well be colder, so spare batteries and warm clothes are a must. And health and safety must be properly accounted for in your risk assessments for working at nights, either working in pairs or looking at whether you need high vis or warning nights and such like. So as part of the baseline, there are some tools online to help you get started. There is a sky glow simulator at need-less.org.uk, which lets you visit a location uh, virtually and for it to give you an indication of uh, what light pollution is already present in that area or which direction light pollution will be visible in remote areas. There's also Google Earth overlays to give you an indication of where uh, the primary dark sky areas are and where light pollution is, is most prominent at avex-asso.org. And the Campaign for Dark Skies at britastro.org provides some useful information, including maps to indicate the relationship between uh, light pollution and the number of clear nights that, that an area gets per year. So the clearest skies are also affected by weather. The furthest areas from habitation don't necessarily provide the highest numbers of opportunities to experience dark skies. So with all these tools, you start to build a picture of the value of dark skies at a location, together with light pollution maps, environmental zones, tranquility maps, landscape character assessments, etc. So during the field work, record the sources, height and locations of existing lights near the site. Select your viewpoints during the day to represent the daytime and nighttime sensitivity, choosing the same viewpoints where possible. But do remember health and safety in the dark and um, the difficulty of refinding that, that first location. The viewpoint sensitivity may vary between night and day. The remote, remote footpaths or um, sort of visitor attractions may not be accessible at night, so would not be sensitive viewpoints at that time. So choose locations away from overhead lights if possible just to minimize the chance of lens glare and avoid roads in the view where possible to avoid light trails. So record the viewpoint location to, to allow accurate repositioning for night photog photography, remembering it will be dark. So for the night photography, the basics are use a digital SLR with a tripod and a panoramic head if you've got one, but don't use a flash. Follow the Landscape Institute guidance on photography and photomontage. Keep a consistent white balance, don't use auto between the shots and the viewpoints and choose your setting related to the lights in the view. It will affect how the photographs um, come out. If you're confident enough to look at the, the shots in raw uh, file format, uh, do that and then that allows you to um, get better representative shots from what you saw um, when you were there on the site. So, as mentioned, review your shots on a tablet on site if you can and make notes. So digital cameras will accurately meter the exposure required, but beware of cars, etc., passing through, increasing the light in the scene during photographs. So very dark scenes will not photograph well at night, so it's better to photograph when some visible landscape is present. And record the weather conditions and notes on sky glow and distant lights whilst there. 
There is also an app for the iPhone which allows you to combine the photography with a dark sky survey and there's useful advice at darkskydiary.wordpress.com. It basically uses the, the iPhone's camera to record the available light and give you an indication of what the um, how, how dark the sky is at that location. So the visual assessment, visual assessment is separate from landscape assessment. Consider the individual and cumulative visual effects of light and lighting. Include infrastructure on amenity of daytime views, on effects on nighttime visual amenity, on lighting hierarchy, and of course on residential amenity. But if it's completely dark, does that mean there's no existing view? Not strictly. If views of starlit skies are lost due to glare or contrast or the residential amenity is reduced by introduced light, even though it doesn't form a statutory nuisance, then residential amenity could be significantly affected. Same goes for landscape assessment. Is the night landscape character properly recorded? Do your own assessment if you need to. Are the key characteristics of the landscape character areas at and remote from the site significantly affected? Is perception of a dark area changed by visible lights? Use professional judgment to determine the significance of changes based on sensitivity and magnitude. And then communicating your effects. Remember the, the zones of theoretical visibility may change depending on the heights of the lighting compared to the main part of the development. And how will those lights be viewed from more distant areas? Does that change the apparent landscape character as viewed from those other areas and indeed change the landscape character at those areas? And of course use photographs and visualizations as you can for changes in the daytime view and of course at nighttime view using you can use IES files to give accurate um, photometry sort of information from the chosen lighting. So we have a choice over how our landscapes evolve. We can be world leading in assessment, policy, land use planning and monitoring if we are willing. Preventing new and reversing old light pollution is a worthy effort to provide healthy places and improve our quality of life. So it's all about the right lights at the right place for the right time for the right reason. Thank you. Hi there. Thanks, Carl, for that. That was fascinating. I've certainly learned a lot. Um, not that I'm the expert, but um, I'm just having a look here. I'm um, just going to undock this. We haven't currently got any questions, so please now is your opportunity, everyone, to ask Carl um, or myself. I can certainly pass them on to our technical group uh, and our head of technical here at ELI um, if you do want to ask us any questions. On what you've just seen or the subject in general. Um, <clears throat> if you do think of a question after we finish this webinar today, uh, there will be a feedback form that will automatically get sent to you. Um, so if you don't want to share your question with the whole group or ask it now, please do um, send that to me afterwards and we'll we'll try and get um, a response to you. Um, Carl, is there anything you'd like to add? Um. I think just to make the point really that this, this was uh, a bit of an introduction for uh, the subject more than trying to tell you exactly how to do a landscape visual impact assessment. It is a relatively new area. People are, people are developing methodologies all the time. So um, the idea is to get an interim technical guidance note out as, as soon as time allows really just to start helping people and then build on that uh, into the future. Mm, okay. So um, we've got questions, same question from Chiara and Robert, just asking if the presentation will be available afterwards. Um, <clears throat> we're going to review this um, and see if we're happy with the recording um, and if uh, there aren't any technical hitches or if um, if Carl and myself are happy with it, we, we may be able to upload this onto YouTube. If you just need something from the presentation slides, um, Carl, um, that's up to you if you'd like to share this with everybody. Yeah, happy to do that. Yeah, happy to do that. Wonderful. Um, Catherine also asks the question, uh, what's the policy coverage in Wales? Uh, to be honest, I'm not familiar with that, so I would have to uh, review that. So I know 
um, so areas of outstanding natural beauty in particular are, 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 you know the people involved with those are, are ahead of the game really just because that it is mentioned at a higher level but um, I couldn't I couldn't tell you to be honest yeah, it's always difficult when we go into um, different areas I know we, we were talking with um, Sue Illman the other week about suds and there's a whole different kettle of fish when you get to Scotland waters Scottish waters and things like that so yes um, we might be able to find out Catherine for you. I'll pass this on to our head of technical and see if he has um, any more knowledge on whales. Um, Simon asks, um, hi Carl, having never done a nightmare darkness survey, is that a component part of the GL, uh, GVLA to be done by the LA? By the landscape, you mean the landscape architect yeah. or the, the local authority? Yes, um, landscape architect. Yeah, well I think uh, there is it depends exactly what you are assessing of course and the lighting professionals will be assessing and presenting uh, the lighting levels such as ISO lux plans uh, looking at whether there is likely to be a nuisance uh, to to people's uh, homes etc um, and whether there are any safety issues but landscape architects are of course looking at whether the lighting is achieving what it was set out to do it may not just be functional, it may have aesthetic reasons as well, but it will have knock-on effects for uh, the landscape and potentially for, for visual immunity and in views, which won't be looked at by lighting professionals specifically and they won't have the same level of training or understanding as landscape architects do in that area. Of course there are other effects uh, on lighting, from lighting as well, such as on ecology um, for example, which um, again, is is going to be in the in the sort of um, area for ecologists to look at, but they won't have the the lighting knowledge either. So this is why we've mentioned about interdisciplinary working. Really, it's providing um, input from the right experts into the right areas. Uh, every scheme, or not every scheme, will require an assessment because it's up for for you and the planning authorities to decide what is likely or should be considered at a planning application stage. But the principles really should just be carried through and, and even if an assessment isn't required, the general principles of what to consider when designing the lighting um, will, will make a big difference. Hmm, absolutely. Okay, um, I can't see any more questions that have come through at this point. Um, so, oh, Simon says thank you, <laughs> Carl. Um, okay. Great. So please do uh, feel free to send them afterwards uh, on the feedback form um, and otherwise, oh, oh, thank you also from Robert, all, all very, very kind bunch. <laughs> oh, Chris, <laughs> for you. Um, lighting designs are often not sufficiently developed at the point where we are undertaking our assessments, so how do you overcome this? Yeah, it is a big problem, of course. People or developers don't really want to be offering this kind of information until they, they really have to and, and normally not before the planning application stage and, unless, for example, there is an obvious potential problem, for example, if there is a policy in place um, in the local development plan which specifically requires um, uh, lighting to be looked at. So it really does need a bit of teamwork really from uh, everybody such that you know that the people at the, the planning authorities are sufficiently aware of the potential issues and and to deal with those potential issues in a proportionate way for landscape architects to um, help promote good design and the minimizing of environmental effects if that is uh, sort of advocated as being dealt with as an earlier stage as possible then the, the, the main benefit there is, of course, is that it may save um, the developer time if, if it suddenly becomes a, a, an issue late in the day. So I think it, it is a problem and I think it is going to take some time for, for these issues to become the norm. But um, I think if, if everybody is raising these as potential issues or at least considerations as early in the, the, the design and assessment process, um, as early as possible, then, then this, this sh hopefully should be less of a problem moving forward. I'm not saying it will, will ever disappear. It, you, of course, in the LVIAs, you will have to make some assumptions. And if you 
consider that there is the potential for significant effects, if they are not providing you with um, more definitive type of information, you will need to try and agree some assumptions with them so that you can base your assessment on. Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, we've had another question from Catherine, but I've answered that privately just about the presentation slides again. Um, so we are a bit ahead of time, so we do have a bit, a few more minutes if anybody does want to ask a question. So, um, it obviously means you've covered everything perfectly, Carl. <laughs> That's good. Some topics evoke more uh, debate than others, don't they? Um, oh, Tim asks the question, is there any guidance yet on impacts on ecology? Um, not in a, a comprehensive sort of way. There, it's, it's all coming together now, really. I think, um, for example, uh, Mike Oxford is, is looking at um, the effects in relation to bats in more detail with British standards. Um, and there, there is a lot of research been done out there in relation to, to insects and birds, um, but it's not being compiled and this is one of the aims really of, of pulling together the, the interdisciplinary guidance that I, that I discussed because, um, because of that lack of uh, a one-stop uh, place to go to for this information. So we're hoping over the, the next year or so that that will improve um, significantly. But um, I don't think there's any one place at the moment that you can go to to get that information. Okay, thank you. Nikki asks, lighting assessments from engineers are usually very technical. Is there any guidance or training help uh, to help LPA officers understand them and assess impacts of development? Yeah, well, I think the, the PLG04 document that I referred to from the Institute of Lighting Professionals is um, a good start point. Um, they do look technical, but I, I think that document will um, give you a good start point. Uh, the building research establishment do do training courses on this, and I've attended one in the past myself, which isn't too technical, um, but it's the right sort of level for you to um, to, to learn a lot while, whilst not going in too deep. So. I would look out for for those training training courses there. I think one of the problems is that there is so much guidance out there, and a lot of it is very technical. It's a little bit overwhelming. So, again, it's a it's another reason really why I'm very keen to to push forward um, this this new guidance um, as quickly as possible to to make it as accessible to as as, as many different people who who will be contributing to to the assessments and the designs as possible. Carl, could you just repeat the name of the um, document again for Nikki? Sure. It is called, well, it's, its technical number is PLG04, and it's by the Institute of Lighting Professionals. Unfortunately, it's not a massive document, but it's, it's, not, a, it's not a cheap document either. Um, I think it's about 70 or 80 pounds. I'm just looking for the exact title now. Bear with me. So it's the guidance on undertaking uh, environmental light impact assessments. But if you go to the Institute of Lighting Professionals website, they, they have a page there specifically with their publications on, and you'll, you'll quickly find it. Mm. Uh, Nikki says thank you. Robert asks, are councils receptive to reduced lighting? Um, well, more often than not, the times that I have to deal with, with this subject is when it has been raised by parish councils, um, even if it hasn't been raised by the district or, or county councils. Um, but it is increasingly getting getting requested, so I think that is only only really going to continue. I feel it's a little bit like when the the, the British standard for um, protection of trees during construction first came out. There was a bit of a lag time between um, that coming out and councils picking up and that, and on really specifying the approach 
to follow in relation to that document, and now now it's pretty much the norm. So I, I'm hoping really that it's a, on an upward trend, and, um, and that can be accelerated with more accessible guidance moving forward. Okay. Well, uh, once again, they do seem to trickle through, um, and we have got 15 minutes left if we would like, but um, I can't see any more questions now. So I think we could probably tie that up there. Um, thank you to everybody who attended today. Um, quite a large number of you, I'm very, very impressed. Um, thank you to Carl greatly for your time and effort uh, on this um, today. We really, really appreciate it. And um, we'll get the presentation uh, over to whoever wants it. Just um, uh, send me an email on the feedback form and I can get that to you. Um, otherwise, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you and thank you to Carl. Goodbye. Okay, thank you all.